Okay, well, I hope you all had a happy Thanksgiving, and we're back in class on TRACO. And in the course, we've talked about cancer treatment with chemotherapeutics, kinase inhibitors, radiation therapy. Uh, but probably the best way is if you can prevent cancer by detecting it early when it's still in a reversible stage. So today we have Eva Zabo from the Division of Cancer Prevention. She's going to talk about non-small cell lung cancer. Eva. Thank you, Terry. Um, so I'm going to talk about non-small cell lung cancer, both as uh, treatment and as prevention. And I have to say, this is really strange. I know that there are a lot of people on the phone, uh, but uh, seeing four people, wow, I'm going to be looking at you guys. And if you fall asleep, I'm sorry. <laughs> so uh, just to give a little bit of background. So U.S. lung cancer statistics, I've been doing this for, I don't know, 15 years or whatever, and the estimates continue to go up. Uh, number of new cases for uh, 2014, about 220,000, about almost 160,000 deaths are ex expected. You see that ratio, most people who develop lung cancer die. That's the bottom line. Uh, this is the leading cause of cancer deaths, more so than the next three leading causes of cancer deaths in the U.S. put together. Um, however, the good news uh, is that the death rate has been decreasing uh, since the 90s. Um, it's finally decreasing in women. Um, that has taken a long time. And you can see that uh, here. Uh, this is uh, years, uh, 1990s. You really had the peak in the number of deaths in men. Uh, and then you have a fairly steep decline, although it's still a huge number of deaths. This is lung cancer. These are all the other cancers. In women, uh, the number of lung cancer deaths is not quite as out of proportion, although it's still a very substantial number, and it's only now starting to go down. Okay? And the bottom line is that the five-year survival is dismal, 16%. It's only gone up a little bit since 60 years ago. Um, and this is because you don't find lung cancer until it's generally spread. So this is one of my favorite slides. It's a little bit old, but it's the, the title, Radiographic Evidence Linking Tobacco Use to Lung Cancer. So the cancer is right here. You've got this uh, muddy lung with a little bit of holes here and some fibrotic things. These little holes are emphysema. And there's your cigarette pack of cigarettes on the x-ray. Uh, and that sort of sums up about 85% of lung cancer, but by no means all. So the risk factors are tobacco, secondhand smoking, as of course not as much, but uh, still a significant uh, component, but it's mainly active smoking. Prior air digestive malignancies, head neck cancer, all of this is generally related to smoking. Um, COPD also, so emphysema, chronic bronchitis, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, all of which is generally associated with smoking, but not always. Those are the main causes. There are other exposure, uh, exposures, asbestos, indoor radon, that's why you have your house tested uh, before you buy it. Uh, a number of less common uh, exposures, um, and some genetic predispositions. Some people don't metabolize uh, tobacco carcinogens as well as others. Uh, there are susceptibility loci that have been identified to the acetylcholine, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor subunits. Uh, um, so um, we're learning more, but the bottom line is tobacco. And this is the problem with lung cancer. So we generally think of cancer in terms of state. Clinically, we approach cancer uh, by staging it. Staging has to do with the size and the regional and distance spread. The smallest cancers, these are stage one, which are three centimeters or less in size. The five-year survival is still only 60%. It's not uh, all due to lung cancer because people who smoke uh, and people who are older, the prime lung cancer um, uh, patient, have other cardiovascular diseases, emphysema, and so on but a large part of it is lung cancer. And even from the smallest tumors, it goes downhill very rapidly. So that's the reason why Terry said 
much better to prevent than to treat. Having said that, I'm going to talk a fair amount about treatment because there really has been a revolution as to how we uh, approach lung cancer, the personalized uh, uh, cancer therapeutics. Um, and I think uh, this has, this is, everybody should know it is the bottom. So not all lung cancer is the same. Uh, about 80% uh, is what we call non-small cell lung cancer, which used to be grouped together because it's not small cell lung cancer. And I think you probably had a lecture on that or will have a, okay, you will have a lecture on that. Um, and the grouping historically is because small cell for the past 30 years, we've known, is very chemotherapy responsive. Not, not saying curable in the most uh, cases, but still very responsive. And now small cell classically has not been as responsive. So it used to be grouped together because it was approached all the same way. That is changing. But the majority of uh, non-small cells are adenocarcinomas. Uh, and that includes the majority of people who are never smokers. They generally fall into this adenocarcinoma category. However, because of the number of cases, most adenocarcinomas are still in smokers. Squamous cell carcinomas, which used to be the most common uh, type of uh, non-small cell, are now many fewer. It has to do with how uh, cigarettes are smoked and how they're made, so you get much deeper penetration into the periphery of the lung, which is where you find adenocarcinomas out here in the lung, as opposed to centrally, where you find squamous cells and small cells. Large cell is uh, sort of a orphan uh, lung cancer disease. Uh, uh, tends to be peripheral also, a uh, fairly small number, and then there are some atypical carcinoids and so on. Small cell, on the other hand, is, uh, is a very aggressive subtype, tends to be central, um, and is very rapidly growing, uh, but as a result, also people responsible. So I'm really going to talk primarily about non-small cell today uh, and about prevention of non-small cell. Having said that, uh, I sort of want to set up how I'm going to discuss the rest of this uh, talk. So when you start with your normal epithelium, your normal lung, you expose it to whatever terrible things, such as a cigarette, you go through a variety of histologic and molecular changes, uh, early changes such as metaplasia, dysplasia. So instead of having this nice small epithelium, you have a thickened epithelium that becomes more uh, atypical, eventually goes through the basement membrane, and you have the basement cancer. And so you have a very long time to prevent tumor, 20, 40 years of exposure. You have a shorter time to detect it early, still uh, cure it. That's in the dysplasia, really in the early uh, invasive small carcinoma stage. And then, of course, you have uh, about two years uh, treated if it's metastatic, a little bit less time. So let's start with treatment. So the treatment is very anatomically based. Lung cancer, like everything else, again, we're just talking about not small cell. Early stage tumors, small ones, are treated with surgery. If there, uh, if uh, there, uh, there is lymph node involvement, okay, or other uh, poor prognostic indicators, but mainly lymph nodes, then adjuvant chemotherapy is added on to that. Once you start to spread to the central lung, the mediastinal lymph node, you're really out of the surgery alone category. And then we tend to use combined modality, so uh, chemo, uh, radi radiation therapy with chemotherapy, sometimes with surgery. And once you're past that, if you have pleural fusion, if you have uh, met metastatic disease, either within the lung, multiple nodules, or outside the lung, you generally have to use some kind of systemic therapy, chemotherapy, with radiation and even uh, resection of isolated metastasis as needed for control. Small cell, it's all uh, uh, chemotherapy-based, plus or minus radiation for specific uh, scenarios. So, as I said, we used to think of all non-small cell as being the same, um, but we now know that that's not true. Uh, 
And um, where we really know it is uh, in the case of lung cancer carcinoma. So about 40 to 50 percent of all non small cells. You can find various abnormalities, molecular abnormalities, which this pie chart is growing daily. There may be uh, 40 percent of non small cell lung cancers that, that don't have some of these known molecular uh, aberrations, many of which can be targeted for treatment. And so let me show you some data, which uh, actually where treatment targeting these specific uh, abnormalities has become standard first-line therapy. So EGFR, the poster child of personalized uh, uh, treatment. Uh, it is a, an important growth factor signaling pathway involved in many integral processes involved in carcinogenesis, growth, survival, uh, anti-ictosis, invasion metastasis, you name it. And I'm sure that you will hear about this or have heard about it elsewhere. Well, in the case of non-small cell lung cancer, this is frontline therapy for a small subgroup of people, about 10% of all comers, which is about 50% of uh, never smokers. It's a small but extremely important subgroup where targeting the epidermal growth factor receptor with a specific tyrosine kinase inhibitor, erlotinib, afatinib, carcina is the name you may uh, have heard in the lay literature, uh, actually results in very high response rates, prolonged disease stability, so typically 8 to 14 months of response, and probably uh, longer survival. I'd say probably because those studies have been a bit harder to do, mainly because it doesn't matter whether you give that uh, uh, treatment upfront or after chemotherapy. As long as you give it to somebody who's got the proper genotype, which is an EGFR mutation in their tumor, uh, you can actually get a very significant clinical response. And people live about 30 months or so on the average, which means some live much longer, comparing that to all comers with lung cancer, where average survival with stage 4 disease is more like 12 to months. So this has been a very important uh, therapeutic change, uh, really in the past uh, 10 years, less than 10 years. And so erlotinib is now approved as a single agent for first-line treatment of metastatic disease. Second line after failure of chemotherapy, even third line after failure of two chemotherapies or more. Uh, it's uh, proof for maintenance and studies are ongoing for adjuvant treatment, in other words, in completely resected uh, populations. So, standard of care. A second very important um, molecular abnormality is the EML4 ALK fusion gene. Uh, this is, again, the poster child of rapid, I say that in quote, uh, drug development. This abnormality was first identified in 2007, so that's about seven years ago. Um, it's uh, about 5% of all non-small cells in the United States. Again, it's almost primarily in never smokers. And there is a, an inhibitor, chrysoxanib, which was really uh, developed uh, as an inhibitor of the oncogene MET, um, but it's also um, uh, is an uh, excellent inhibitor of this uh, fusion gene product um, and uh, has very similar response rates to erlotinib in EGFR mutated uh, non small cell, about a 60% response rate. The majority of the rest of those people have stable disease. The length of the response is, again, about 8, eight to 12 months. And now there's even a second-line patient that has gone through very rapid uh, development, Sritinib, which is also approved for people who have progressed on Quizopinib or can't tolerate it. So this is a very rapidly moving field, but people who have these abnormalities, um, there is a lot of work being done and lots of options at least two other drugs in development here. ROS1. Again, this is something that uh, is a fairly new thing. ROS is a, a tyrosine kinase uh, member. Uh, 
it's a present kinase uh, 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 protein. Uh, rearrangements uh, are, again, very similar to AML4 ALK, are present in a small, now we're getting into smaller numbers of uh, patients, 1.7%, so less than 2% of all uh, uh, people with non-small cell cancer. Uh, multiple different partners, but again, Prisopna is an extremely uh, effective uh, agent for this particular um, rearrangement. Uh, with a very long median duration of response. So this is a small subgroup. And this is actually the good news and the bad news, uh, depends on how you look at it, that we're finding these people who have these driver mutations that can be targeted with specific drugs. But as you can see, these are small subgroups. And so now we're starting to really have to do a lot of looking when somebody is first um, identified with non-small cell to see whether they have the appropriate uh, uh, abnormalities that should be targeted. Those are the three main ones, uh, two of which are approved with targeted therapies. The third one, I think it's coming very quickly. That's that Ross one. Pertinue is something that's found frequently. Um, not as easy to target uh, as the others, although uh, there are definitely some data suggesting that for specific mutations of protein, in a small number of people, you can have good efficacy. RAF, similar, BRAF, uh, the drugs that are used for melanoma are effective. The RET fusion gene, which is, again, fairly rare. Uh, uh, and there are reports now of, of small numbers of cases. So we're making small incremental progress, however, all of these people eventually progress on this therapy and become refractive. Squamous cell carcinoma, a lot harder, <coughs> excuse me, a lot harder to target, and there are no approved therapies there. These two uh, molecular abnormalities, FGF uh, receptor 1 amplification, is frequently um, found, frequently being like of squamous cell carcinoma. This is now mainly in smokers. Everything else I showed you was mainly in never smokers. That's a small group of people. Uh, but there are drugs that target this abnormality uh, that are in development. Whether they will prove to be effective, if it's in smokers, you have many different abnormalities, much more genetically complex tumor, that remains to be seen. Similarly, DDR2 is, uh, is a, a, a gene that has been found uh, in a small number of squamous cells. And at least in vitro, there are drugs to which it's sensitive. But I have not yet seen the results of clinical studies. Uh, as you can imagine, when you're talking about 4% of squamous cells, which are 20% of all non-small lung cancer, you need multi-institutional studies that have really cast a very wide net to do an appropriate, even phase two, small trial. So the other thing that uh, has really changed uh, the whole uh, landscape of treating uh, lung cancer is immunotherapy. And again, I'm not sure whether you've had a melanoma uh, lecture yet, where uh, melanoma is the poster child for immunotherapy, but uh, non-small cell is following in the footsteps. So um, the checkpoint uh, uh, inhibitors, which, uh, to make it pathetically simple, which is how I understand immunotherapy, uh, which uh, essentially uh, uh, undo the blockade of T-cell activity uh, in uh, peripheral tissues, uh, the checkpoint inhibitors, uh, PD-L1 and PD-1 uh, inhibitors, uh, have been uh, shown to be very effective in melanoma are actually the first drug is approved, and there are now excellent data that non-small cell is close, uh, is close second, and I think the uh, uh, expectation is that these drugs, at least one drug, will be uh, approved probably in the next few months uh, for non-small cell. So there is a 
there's uh, the ligand as well as the receptor. PDL1 is the ligand. PD1 is the receptor um, on the T cells. And the response rates with using either antibodies to the ligand or to the receptor are on the order of 15 to 25 percent, depending on which companies run the book. Probably all fairly similar. Um, the PDL1 drugs, receptor uh, drugs, seem to be a little bit better tolerated than the, the, the I'm sorry, the ligand uh, inhibitors seem to be better tolerated. And what's really exciting about this is not so much the 20% response rate, because that's okay, but hardly a whole run, but the fact that for some people, um, who respond, that response goes on and on and on and on. And that is something we don't see in lung cancer. Uh, I told you that even with targeted therapies, the median duration of response uh, is sort of 8 to 14 months. Here, there are people out uh, for year, years, not too many years yet, but more than a year, who've had stable disease or minimal disease. So there is... Um, a lot of excitement that maybe with appropriate harnessing of the uh, system that you can actually convert some of these responses to cures, which we've never done under any circumstances with metastatic, not small cell. So, whoops, so that's, what did I just do? Nothing. Okay. So that's uh, sort of the treatment story in a very pathetic, small nutshell, you know, it's, it, I, I just want to, you have to know that setting to understand why some of us spend our lives doing prevention and early detection, okay? And it's because even with these best treatments, we don't cure people. Maybe we will cure a small subset, we have to figure out who these people are, who will cure, but the vast majority of people want cancer is a death sentence. So how do you reduce mortality? Okay. Uh, from lung cancer. Well, prevent. Okay, so that's what we're going to talk about next. So, uh, this is that long phase from the insults that lead to the initiation of the carcinogenic process through the early phases uh, when you get the progressive histologic and molecular abnormalities until you actually start to go through the basic membrane prevention. Okay? So, the best prevention because 85% of non-small cell is caused by uh, smoking, would be to never smoke, right? Is it as good to stop smoking? Because even today, uh, maybe 20 to 23% of the adult population of the United States still continues to smoke. Is it, uh, should we be telling people to stop smoking? Well, obviously, the answer is yes. But the data for decreasing cancer incidents are not as striking as one would like. So this is uh, an interesting study. It was called the Lung Health Study, which was really a COPD study, where um, the interventions uh, had to do with COPD and with uh, quitting, smoking. And what you see here is that after 14, well, almost 15 years of follow-up, people who quit had about half the mortality of people who continued to smoke. People who quit intermittently had a decrease, but it was not as profound as people who had stopped smoking. But the point that I want to make here is that, of course, there's still a fair amount of lung cancer death, even after people smoked. And these are the 15-year follow-up data. If I would show you the graphs from five years after quitting, there's no change in the number of lung cancer deaths. So in other words, you need to have a long time to see a perceptible difference in lung cancer deaths. And that's because as you continue to smoke, you continue to increase your risk. When you stop smoking, that DNA damage stops, but you still have the risk that you already got. So you really need to go out many years to see in other words, the graphs sort of look like this. If you continue to smoke, your risk goes up. If you stop smoking, it levels off. It doesn't go down. It levels off. Okay. 
So, um, yes, smoking cessation is very important. The sooner, the better. Never stop smoking, even better. Uh, but you still have all these people who, are, who remain at risk. So what can you do with them? So that's where my day job comes in, uh, cancer chemo prevention. And that's going to be the bulk of what I talk about uh, for the rest of this uh, uh, lecture. So chemo prevention is, uh, is a concept really popularized by Michael Sporn in the 70s, so we're talking about 40 years uh, ago, uh, that, that is defined as the use of natural synthetic uh, agents, uh, could even be uh, uh, immunotherapeutic interventions, to suppress or reverse the process of carcinogenesis. So we're no longer talking about an anatomically defined cancer nodule. We're talking about the process that leads to that anatomically defined cancer nodules. So it's regressing existing pre-neoplastic lesions. It's preventing the developing of new such foci, uh, suppressing the recurrence if there had been such neoplastic lesions there previously. And the rationale is pretty straightforward. Can't cure metastatic cancer. Okay? I, I think I can still say that honestly, uh, and probably for the rest of my career, uh, unfortunately. We do know that cancer is preventable from other model systems. For instance, uh, in breast cancer, prevention with tamoxifen uh, is, has been well documented, so with the rope case inhibitors. Multiple animal model systems show that you can do this, although obviously animals are not man and are much less uh, complex. And also the knowledge that we have this long preclinical phase during which there are increasing abnormalities. Therefore, we can identify populations at risk, not just by their smoking history, but hopefully by other uh, demographic and uh, biomarker profiles so that one can actually start to prevent lung cancer. That's the rationale. Okay. The execution has been a little bit less easy to bring forward. So again, a little bit more on the rationale. Uh, when is the best time to intervene? Obviously, if you could intervene with 100% efficacy with metastatic lung cancer, that's where you'd want it to be. But we believe, and maybe that's true, maybe it's not, I think it is, that early cancer or early pre-cancer is more amenable to interventions than late cancer. For instance, early stage lung cancer is more curable than metastatic late stage lung cancer. We think that precursor lesions, because they may be, they probably, not just they probably are, they are less genetically complex, may be more amenable to therapy. If you could prevent the DNA damage or get rid of those abnormal clones early on, that would be the best. Um, but the worry is that there are actually multiple pathways to carcinogenesis. I showed you in, not small, in uh, Never Smokers that there are many, many molecular abnormalities. They generally, um, uh, you have one or the other, okay, mutually exclusive. Um, so there are probably multiple pathways of carcinogenesis, which may require multiple ways of dealing with this abnormal process. The other thing is that once you start to intervene, you're going to get toxicity from an intervention. It doesn't matter what it is. You know, aspirin is not completely safe, it has side effects. Tylenol is not completely safe, it has side effects. Um, and anything uh, stronger than that is also going to have side effects. So the risk benefit, the toxicity profile, needs to be carefully considered. The more people at risk, the larger the target population that you need to bring chemo prevention to. So there are more than 90 million current and former smokers in the United States right now. Obviously, we're not going to target 90 million people just for the prevention of lung cancer. We can't do it to break the bank, even if we knew how to do it. So we need to figure out how to target the highest risk um, um, subjects. And of course, anything that you do has its costs, both resource-wise, psychologically, uh, turning people into patients because they're drugs, et cetera. And it's very important to um, weigh 
the risks and the benefits, okay? Benefits in terms of the efficacy, okay, to prevent not just cancer, but also cancer-associated morbidity, of course, mortality. But then there are the risks, the side effects that increase morbidity and mortality from other diseases. For instance, some of you may be uh, familiar with the Celecoxib uh, story and the Biox story. Biox was a great COX-2 that was used for pain. Okay, it's a non-steroidal uh, until it was shown to increase cardiovascular disease uh, risk of uh, uh, myocardial infarction. It was actually shown to do that in a cancer prevention trial, not for lung cancer, but for colon cancer. Effective in regressing polyps, but also effective in causing MIs to went right off the market. So um, those major morbidities and, mort uh, and mortality are very important. You can't afford to substitute one, um, one um, disease for another when you try to prevent. And then there's the minor uh, morbidity from, uh, and the tolerability associated with drugs. You know, coming from the oncology point of view, if you tell me that I give you a drug and you have a three to five bouts of diarrhea a day, I can deal with that. But are you going to take the drug for years if it's going to give you diarrhea every day? I don't think I would. So tolerability becomes very important when you're talking about prevention in the setting of people thinking that they're healthy and essentially feeling healthy. Uh, it's not as much of an issue for uh, cancer treatment. So how do we go about then uh, uh, preventing uh, or finding these agents uh, for uh, cancer prevention? Knowledge of mechanism, okay? which actually I submit to you, we don't really know the mechanisms of early lung cancer development, especially in smoking, very well. So we often go to preclinical uh, data in vitro and animal models, uh, and we use those as models for what could happen in people, although, of course, like I said, a mouse is not a man. Uh, and so the translation from animal models to human beings can be difficult and is often inexact. We go to uh, the literature uh, and uh, epidemiology, uh, cohort and case control studies. Again, uh, some cases they've been very effective in identifying uh, effective agents, uh, not so much for lung cancer. Uh, nothing jumps out like that easily. And of course, we look at the clinical trials, for instance, drugs that have been used in adjuvant treatment to see whether second primary cancers in that target organ are prevented. But for lung cancer, so far, the, all the actual treatments are chemotherapy. That's never going to be uh, something that you can use for prevention. So I'm going to tell you three short stories of how we've tried to develop uh, 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 lung cancer preventive agents, uh, what kind of data we looked at, and what we did. Uh, this is a work in evolution still. Uh, so one is the inflammation story, uh, steroids. Lots of data in the literature going back to the 70s uh, showing that corticosteroids, so in other words, uh, immune suppression, if you will, uh, is effective or are effective in animal models, in skin animal, skin cancer animal models, lung cancer animal models, and you can even use inhaled delivery to prevent cancer in animals. This is a Book of Lee Wattenberg, who is one of the granddaddies of this field. And because inhaled steroids are used for COPD or asthma, uh, you can actually test that concept in humans, which is exactly what Epidemiology uh, for this kind of a approach was plus minus, I would say. Uh, most of the studies uh, were done in asthma or in COPD, but were fairly short duration. Uh, although there is one study that uh, using a Veterans Administration cohort showing that people with COPD used steroid, inhaled steroids had a much decreased risk of lung cancer compared to people with COPD who did not. This is a, it is what it is. It's a problematic study, but it is what it is. So um, just to show you how we do some of these studies, we being the royal we, not me, uh, but uh, members of uh, Division of Cancer Prevention. This 
this is one such example where animals were given a carcinogen, in this case, uh, vinyl carbonate, which uh, gives adenomas and adenocarcinomas in mice. You can count the lesions. And what you see here is that when budesonide, which is a steroid that is available uh, systemically or in enhanced form, when it's given in the diet, you get an 80% decrease in the number of tumors of uh, these animals. And the tumors that are there are primarily adenomas as opposed to carcinoma. So you shift towards a more benign histology. What you're really doing is you're delaying the conversion to uh, carcinoma. So it's data such as this that uh, caused us to uh, uh, work with Stephen Lamb at the uh, British Columbia Cancer Agency in Canada to do uh, what's, what I would consider sort of a classic standard uh, phase two lung cancer, lung dysplasia trial. So uh, what Stephen did is he screened about 1,000 people with sputum cytology. Those who had sputum cytology abnormalities, in other words, atypia, were then invited to uh, undergo a bronchoscopy where you put a tube down uh, into the lungs and visualize uh, the bronchial, the central bronchial airways, um, and can do targeted biopsies. Okay. And he identified, so out of about 560 people who underwent bronchoscopy, 112, actually about 230 or so, had dysplasia, and 112 agreed to go on study. They were randomized to receive either inhaled budesonide or placebo for six months, and then underwent a second bronchoscopy, uh, where they underwent, again, uh, multiple biopsies of all the sites that had been biopsied previously at any new sites. And they also underwent a helical CT to see whether there are any nodules in the lungs. Um, to make a long story short, so this is clearly a huge amount of work, huge amount of work. So kudos to Dr. Glenn for being able to do it. Uh, out of the uh, 1,040 screen, actually 13 wound up having cancer uh, on diagnosis. They did not go on study. Um, and when all was said and done after the six months of treatment, the complete response rate in the placebo and in the budesonide arms were about the same. About 30% of people had complete regression of all the lesions. Uh, about 45 uh, to 50% had progression to higher grades of abnormalities with new lesions. Uh, no difference between the two groups. Okay. Um, so it is what it is. Uh, what was interesting, though, was that CT detected lung nodules, okay, which was really a secondary endpoint. Uh, there was a statistically significant decrease in the number of nodules. Now, the animal data that I showed you looked at adenoma and adenocarcinoma, in other words, peripheral lung lesions. This bronchial dysplasia study was looking at the central airways where squamous cell carcinomas uh, appear. The reason we did this is because it was the only way we knew how to do it, uh, because the study was started before uh, helical CT, spiral CT really became part of uh, the things that we could do. Um, so um, there was a little bit of a mismatch between the animal data and the human data. Um, so maybe all is correct. So the next study that we uh, elected to do, because CT screening entered uh, the therapeutic landscape, the imaging landscape, uh, was to actually ask, well, given these data with regression with budesonide, uh, if you only look at people who have peripheral nodules, smokers who have some of these nodules would presumably be at the carcinoma precursors, can you find an effect? So this is a study uh, performed with Julia Veronese at the European Institute of Oncology, uh, which has a has and had and has a CT screening program, and um, they took smokers with persistent CT detected lung nodules. Could be any kind of nodule that was not felt to be cancer. If it was felt to be cancer or needed to look up for cancer, obviously that took priority. 
and then randomized uh, for a year of inhaled budesonide or placebo. Uh, and then they had their next screening CT. So this was intercalated into the CT screening trial. And the primary endpoint was shrinkage of nodules. So I won't pretend to say that this was the perfect study. Uh, what is uh, what are the problems? Well, if you see what the nodules are, but you don't know what they are because they're small. They're too small to biopsy. If they need to be biopsied, but there were clinical reasons, and so those people were excluded. So what we found uh, was that uh, overall there was no statistically significant response. But if you start to uh, look at the different types of nodules, uh, there was a differential response albeit this is secondary, not pre-planned analysis. So what we found was that the solid nodules, the small little disciples, and probably 25% of people have these smokers, uh, those did not change at all with budesonide. But the non-solid, things that are known as ground glass opacities, I'm going to show you a picture in a minute, there we started to see a difference with budesonide versus placebo. And when we followed these people who were treated for one year, and we followed the non-solid nodules okay, over the next five years, so their uh, continued screening uh, protocol, the budesonide-treated people, there was a gradual decrease, and there was a significant difference in nodule size. Okay. This is only in the non-solid nodules. Now, what does this mean? What are these non-solid nodules? Well, this is what they look like. They're, uh, they're, not, they're not solid, okay? This is solid. That's the subject of the side of. This is something that you feel like you could see through it, okay? And what some of these uh, lesions are is this. This is a typical actinomatous hyperplasia. It is, uh, instead of having nice, thin alveolar septi, you have this thick and then you have these cuboidal cells, as opposed to the nice, flat, type, type 1 uh, cells that cover most of the And in various studies that looked at removed lesions, these are primarily big lesions, more than a centimeter in some cases, this atypical alveolar hyperplasia, or AAH, is found in 25 to 50% of these ground glass opacities. Why does this matter? So we don't really know the natural history, but it has been uh, hypothesized that the, some of these are the precursors for lung adenocarcinoma. Uh, here's one study that shows that, especially in smokers, uh, who have these non-solid nodules, they tend to grow over time. And I'll show you one example who is uh, actually one of our patients uh, who is not part of the screen study in our intramural clinic, but somebody, a woman, a middle-aged woman, who was found to have this nodule when she went to the ER for chest pain. Okay. They did a CT thinking that she had a nipples um, and found this. And the follow-up three months later, because the follow-up is the ER, is still there. Then, like many people, she did go for additional CAT scans, despite being do so. Six years later, it's still there. It's a little bit bigger now, but it's still not solid. And then a year later, here it is, uh, a little bit bigger yet, and now solid. And when that was taken out here, uh, it was a basic adenocarcinoma. So this is, again, this is not uh, proof, but this is, uh, and, and in addition to the basic adenocarcinoma, there were areas of adjacent AAH. So this suggests to us that some of these lesions will develop cancer, and also that it takes a long time. You know, we've never looked at those lesions before CT, so we don't know what's actually been going on in people's lungs. But I think that some of these lesions are what we need to pay attention to, and that's what we're now targeting for cancer prevention. I'll just show you a little bit more data. This is from the National Lung Screening Trial, the CT screening study, where we asked the question. So I'll show you its main uh, outcomes, which is decreased death from lung cancer. But uh, we asked for people who have these non 
solid nodules, um, are they at increased risk of developing cancer? So this study was done in such a way that people had three screen, three CTs at yearly intervals and then had extended follow-up. So we can follow those nodules over time. But what we did do is we went back and asked the five, five to eight years later, how many people had lung cancer? And we could tell which lobe of the lung they were in and which lung they were in. Do they correlate with the lesions that they had? And for ground glass, these non-solid nodules, the risk of cancer went way up at later time points. Early on, it was actually down because those are not cancer uh, at the time that you first see them. But years later, people who had those nodules have a significantly increased risk of lung cancer, and it was in the load that the original nodule was in. That's sort of the best data that we could come up with uh, to follow the natural history. So this, again, suggesting that ground glass nodules have an increased risk of turning into lung cancer, but some of them are actual precursors. So how do we move forward? What do we do? So we now think that the way to look at peripheral lung adenocarcinoma prevention is to focus on these ground glass pathogens. And that's what the new studies, one new study right now is going to look at. Okay. What drug do we want to use? Well, we're still in the um, anti-inflammatory mindset. Okay. Um, and uh, instead of going to the inhaled steroids, where there's some question as to how well they get out to the periphery, because they're optimized really more for asthma, so more centralized. Um, I'd like to bring to your attention this study by Peter Rothwell. Uh, it's a whole series of meta-analyses that he did, looking at aspirin and cancer mortality. And what you see here is that people who took aspirin versus those not, so these were intervention trials, uh, that the risk of lung cancer death is about 30 to 40 percent decreased. But it's primarily later on. So it, you don't see the effect until about five years from the time they started taking their aspirin. But this is the effect on death. And it's on adenocarcinoma only, okay? not on squamous cell carcinoma. So our thinking is that if you die five years later, your precursors, you, your invasive lung cancer, would have occurred somewhere around here, to be south, maybe. Your precursor lesions would have been present right here. And so if we can bring aspirin to people at a time that they have precursors, we can prevent development of full-fledged invasive and so the study that is ongoing, again, with our colleagues at the University of Oncology, which just opened, is to take smokers who are undergoing CT screening, uh, who have persistent, but this time only non-solid nodules, non-solid or part solid nodules. These, these lesions that we think are uh, enriched for the atypical adenomatous hyperplasia to see whether giving them low-dose aspirin uh, will change the progression to cancer, a really the regression of these patients. And so this is this has just started, um, and will probably take us about two years to get results. I'll tell you a second story, and these are going to be much quicker. Um, so myonositol, it's a food constituent, a uh, source of uh, several second uh, uh, messengers, uh, signaling molecules, found in rice and various other things. Uh, a fairly long history in small studies in the literature, um, found to be quite effective in animal studies. Again, the work of uh, Lee Wattenberg inhibited uh, carcinogenesis both in smoke-induced models as well as in carcinogen-induced models. Um, and uh, importantly, this is a uh, drug, food constituent, that is grass, generally regarded as safe uh, by FDA terminology, which means that you could just do it, you don't need to get special permission uh, or IND, FDA. So 
again, Stephen Lamb in British Columbia did uh, the phase one study where uh, he determined a tolerable dose. What made it intolerable? Diarrhea. So more than um, 18 grams a day gave some level of diarrhea. And what he found was that uh, there was a statistically significant decrease in the regression of dysplasia. Historic, so this was a phase one study, so there were, this was not the control. But historical controls, uh, about 50% of people regress. I showed you some of that data with the best guide. And here, almost everybody had regression of dysplasia. Okay? So um, we were very lucky to work with Avi Spira at Boston University, who took uh, the samples that Stephen has been collecting and started to ask, what are the pathways that are uh, abnormal in people who have functions with dysplasia? But he did it in an interesting way, not by looking at the lesions, but by looking at the, the field, the normal epithelium. So uh, bronchial brushings in people who have lesions elsewhere. And what he found was that the PI3 kinase pathway, which is frequently regulated in actual cancers, is actually deregulated even in the normal adjacent epithelium, and also in people who have adjacent areas of dysplasia, in other words, the precursor. And with myoinositol, you can inhibit this PI3K signal. So providing a possible route forward as to how we test it by looking at global gene expression analysis, looking at signatures associated with carcinogenesis, specific pathways that are deregulated. So this gives us the potential for um, identifying people who are at risk because they have, let's say, PI3K signaling, as well as um, dysplasia, which you may or may not pick up as easily. And it allows us to look at things in a different clinical trials model. Obviously, this needs testing, and the testing is through a phase 2B uh, myonositol chemo prevention trial where everybody underwent uh, this uh, profiling, this gene expression signature from normal bronchial epithelium in addition to having the effect of myonositol tested on dysplasia. And so we're finishing up the study now and looking to see how well the gene expression signature holds up. Um, and whether myonositol is effective on bronchial dysplasia. Next year, we'll have those data. We'll have them in the next couple of months, actually. Last story, OK, is uh, something a little bit different. Um, it's a drug called pyoglitazone. The peroxisome proliferate activated receptor gamma, PPAR gamma, is um, actually a target for diabetic drugs. OK, not metformin, which you've probably heard of um, when it comes to cancer prevention. Uh, but it is used for type 2 diabetes. And there's a lot of data, preclinical data, that uh, ligands, which are used in diabetes, induce growth arrest and differentiation in various uh, cell types, including non small cell. There are animal data um, for non small cell, also for head and neck cancer. Um, we actually chose to first go to a head and neck cancer model. So this is all oral here, which is a precursor uh, to oral cancer. It's this yellowish thing. And the reason we went to this is shared etiology with tobacco exposure and then lung. But you can get to these lesions a lot easier. You can biopsy them, yet leave them uh, in situ of where they are, um, and ask, does the drug work? So this was a phase two trial. Uh, Frank Andre, University of Minnesota. Uh, 22 people were, who had oral lipoplakia were treated for three months, and that were, the lesions were measured again and biopsy again. And the response rate in this open label, short trial, was 80% in terms of shrinkage of lesions, uh, although there was not a, uh, uh, there was about a 30% decrease in the level of dysplasia. So even though the, the lesion shrank, what stayed there was the same level of dysplasia as uh, previously. So um, the phase two trial, which is a 100-person trial, is now 
again being looked at, although it did not accrue to 100 people, it only half accrued. So the ability to truly test fibrotozone in polyplakia, I think, is uh, going to be limited. But these are all preliminary data that are leading us to think, should we look at lung, where it's much more difficult to look? So uh, these are some animal models uh, showing that there is delay in, uh, uh, in, uh, 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 in tumors and in cell growth and xenograft models. Uh, and so we have two studies, uh, the orbiplakia study and a pilot pre-surgical study where we're looking at the effect of hybridosome on the normal field as well as tumors, markers within the tumors, just to get a little bit more human data before going to a true prevention trial. These are on the All right, the last couple of minutes, three minutes, five minutes, uh, not giving the due uh, uh, respect to early detection, which is where we probably made the most uh, headway, but let me just go ahead and do that. Um, so, like everything else, screening is not straightforward. Okay, uh, you would think that if you find a cancer on a screening modality, you know, you've done something good, but it's not quite so simple. And there are certain biases that people need to be aware of. Lead time bias, in other words, by looking, you diagnose earlier, but you don't actually postpone death. Because that still comes whenever. You just happen to pick it up earlier. Happens. Length bias. You're only diagnosing the more indolent disease. Really aggressive disease, such as a small cell, is going to happen anyway in between your screening uh, intervals. Uh, so you're only detecting the less uh, aggressive disease with the better prognosis. And then overdiagnosis, which is uh, identifying lesions that are actually unimportant. A person dies that they're going to die from, whether they knew that they had the cancer or not. This is particularly true in prostate cancer, where autopsy studies show that the majority of elderly men have prostate cancer. Okay? But they don't die from prostate cancer. They die from everything else. That's overdiagnosis. So these are things you need to be aware of. Um, and that's why uh, cancer screening studies really need to be done very carefully and in a randomized, obviously not placebo-controlled or blinded fashion. So this is the PLCO, chest X-ray, randomized trial. Uh, had a mortality endpoint, um, showed no effect of chest X-ray. This had been, a, uh, uh, had been years and years of uh, concern or uh, lack of clarity whether chest X-rays can detect cancer. Well, this is fairly different definitively says that they can. But that's in contrast to CT screen, which is much more sensitive, where the National Lung Screening Trial, which was a uh, randomized trial, 53,000 plus current and former smokers uh, with years, uh, and did three screens baseline and then two subsequent yearly screens, and showed a 20% risk of lung cancer death. If you show decrease in the risk of death, it's not overdiagnosis, although there is some overdiagnosis there. And not just in lung cancer death, but all cause mortality, showing that that lung cancer mortality is a significant driver of all cause deaths. Okay. Uh, actually, CT screening uh, is uh, recommended by the US uh, uh, Preventive Services Task Force, uh, and uh, Medicare will cover it some caveats that's uh, latest data. So uh, this is just a, a visual uh, showing uh, the cumulative number of lung cancer cases and the cumulative number of deaths. You find more uh, with CT than chest X-ray, and the death rate is lower than chest X-ray. Okay. Uh, how do we put this? Uh, to use in uh, cancer prevention, because maybe that's the best way to move forward. Well, when you find the lung cancer cases, you also find a lot of nodules. Some of them are going to be those um, uh, ground glass opacities, a 
others will actually be more further along the preclinical the uh, road to cancer. Um, the group from uh, British Columbia Cancer Agency has developed a prediction model that can reasonably identify people who are most likely to develop cancer in the next two years. And so now this gives us, if validated, a tool for identifying people who are at highest risk and we should be moving to cancer prevention trials. So that's how we're going to focus. So to summarize, huge progress has been made uh, in understanding the process of lung cancer genesis. Precision medicine is applicable to a significant but very small subset of, uh, of advanced age patients. Um, it's still the early days of immunotherapy, but there is a lot of excitement to prolong survival, uh, even as a single modality. Um, so uh, we have made lots of progress with the CP, okay, early detection. And all of this together is helping us figure out how, where to go with cancer prevention so that we can truly make a big dent of this disease. That's it. So be happy to answer questions if anybody has. So those were not cancers. Those were the precursor. Well, those were the small lesions that we saw on CT, and it was simply the size of the lesion. Correct. Right. So there, that was not a transition to tumors. Uh, none of those had been biopsy. The rate of cancer was about 2% per year, so a very small number of cases, not different between placebo or the intervention. And, of course, we're grossly underpowered for a cancer report. Okay, we're pleased to have Yves Pommier as our next speaker. He got his MD and PH degree from the University of Paris in France. And he's been at NIH since 1981. He's chief of the Developmental Therapeutics Branch. He serves on many committees at NCI. He's won numerous awards. And he's here to talk to us today about topoisomerase inhibitors in cancer. Okay, thank you. So one of the indications of uh, topoisomerase inhibitors actually is uh, small cell lung cancer. Uh, but they're used in first-line therapy 
for the topo 2 inhibitor and topo side, uh, which is platinum, I guess. And then they're using second line therapy with topo and topo 1 inhibitor. Uh, it's an interesting coincidence. Uh, so the, uh, it's not a simple topic, so that's the issue. Uh, the topoisomerases uh, is relatively complex, but hopefully it's not that complex. And it's not easy to get uh, everything in one review. Usually you have to go fetch many, many different cases because there are six genes and there are different types of drugs and some are antibiotics, some are anti-cancer drugs. So these two reviews will give you sort of a synopsis of the whole thing, where in one review I uh, took the challenge to put together all the topoisomerases, all the topoisomerase inhibitors, and, uh, and then what they are useful for and how they work. So go back to these. When you and many of the slides <coughs> come from these. There is also a book that uh, was edited now a couple of years ago, where you could really find a lot of chapters if you're really interested on topoisomerase biology, which goes far beyond drugs, uh, and, and especially on cancer. And so the complexity of this <coughs> is linked to the fact that the, uh, uh, they are actually, in, uh, in human, uh, six genes. Uh, and they are divided in three groups. They are what we call the top one genes, the top two genes, the top three genes. And the topoisomerases are enzymes that break the DNA backbone. Uh, that's the way they would resolve topological problem. If you assume DNA is like, uh, like any of these long wires, uh, and especially when you have a duplex, it's even worse. Uh, you have all kind of entanglement that will come up. And the way the topoisomerases will resolve these is like I'm doing now, is you need a break to actually get one strand to go around the other, or you need to cut one to get the other through it. And that's what topoisomerases do. And they do that by breaking the backbone. So they introduce a break in the backbone, and they will reseal it. So they are like gates uh, into the DNA. So the type 1 and 3 are, um, and this relatively easy to remember, uh, the odd numbers um, break one strand at a time, and the top two even number break two strands at a time. It's not the way they were numbered, they were numbered by order of appearance. So top one, uh, these are type one, type one B, type one A. The difference between the enzymes, so what I drew here is the DNA duplex, and this is a topo one, this is topo two, topo three. You see topo two works as a dimer, and topo 1 and topo 3 cleave only one strand. Topo 2 will cleave two strands in concert, with uh, each monomer cleaving one strand. And what you have to pay attention is the way the cleavage takes place. So if you think that the enzyme is going to cleave, it's working like a can opener. It is going to open the backbone, and when it does this, it forms a covalent bone on one side. And the polarity... Uh, is what defines the topoisomerase, whether it links to the three prime end, like here, or to the five prime end, like here or there. And that's why the topo three are different from the topo one, because topo one is cleaving and linking to the three prime. So these enzymes, uh, the topo one, there are uh, two topo one, top one nuclear, with all the genes are encoded in the nuclear genome. Uh, but topo 1 is for the nuclear genome. Topo 1 mitochondrial, topo 1 MT is for the mitochondrial genome. There are two topo 2s, topo 2 alpha and topo 2 beta, and then topo 3, topo 3 alpha, topo 3 beta. So if you compare now the humans with uh, E. coli, all the organisms that have DNA have topoisomerase because they have to deal with topological problems. If you compare humans and E. coli, uh, you're going to to two extremes. In human, you have this, uh, the, the six genes, which are in three types. And in E. coli, it's simpler. You only have two types, type 1A and type 2A. So what E. coli doesn't have is this one, is the type 1B. 
So why do we care about these different enzymes? Is because uh, top one is the anti-cancer target of campotensins, which are anti-cancer drugs. Uh, they are natural product. They are uh, toxins from, uh, but they are used for cancer treatment and adenoisoprenine. Topo 2 alpha and beta are the anti-cancer targets of very important drugs I mentioned at the beginning, etoposide, doxorubicin, which is even broader used than etoposide, and mitoxantron, and uh, gyrase and topo 4, in E. coli and other bacteria, are the antibacterial targets of quinolones. So this is a very big spectrum you could see in terms of pharmacology and in terms of medicine. Uh, these enzymes are very critical. Yet, you see the holes. The type 1A, uh, there is no drug targeting type 1A, neither in bacteria nor in, in humans. And this is probably something that the pharmaceutical industry, if they are willing to go into antibiotics, is clearly one, one opportunity. So if you go more into detail in the way the phosphatopoisomerases uh, open the DNA backbone, uh, so this is a representation of the phosphodiester bond. So you have a sugar, sugar, the phosphodiester here, and then one base, another base. The way top isomerases will approach the problem in cleaving DNA is they will use a tyrosine. And the tyrosine then will act uh, as a nucleophile. And uh, this is why the top isomerases are a tyrosyl uh, uh, using enzyme. So the way they will cleave, though, the polarity, if you wish, which whether they go that way, whether they go that way, will depend on the type of the enzyme. I already alluded to the fact that top one will link, as it cleaves, to generate the break, it will link to the three prime end. So all the type 1B, top one, top one empty, have this peculiar characteristic of forming this covenant intermediate as a three prime end. The other topoisomerases, top 2 and top 3, all link to the 5 prime man. In fact, in bacteria, there is no such thing for most, many bacteria such as top 1B. And top 1B, because of this 3 prime linkage, is from the family of Cree recombinase, uh, phage lambda integrase. And it is possible that this top 1, which is used in vertebrates, is actually something that derived from the recombinant enzyme, recombination enzyme, rather than a pure topoisomerase. But yet in humans, top ones are used uh, as DNA relaxation, relaxation enzyme. So let's discuss a little bit about top one. Uh, so top one was discovered um, as the first topoisomerase uh, probably about 40 years ago by uh, Jim Shampoo and uh, Dulbeco. Um, by using a, an extract from murine uh, cells. At the time, it was possible to look at DNA but with ethidium bromide, and one could differentiate supercoiled DNA from relaxed DNA. And what Jim Shampoo discovered is that by adding a drop of cellular extract to supercoiled DNA, the DNA became fully relaxed within minutes. And he called this enzyme and this activity a DNA untwisting enzyme. Untwisting because it will untwist the DNA and it was closed at the end. And the way this is going is by introducing this transient strand break, which enabled the swiveling of the broken strand around the intact strand so you could remove the supercoils. And topoisomerase 1 is therefore essential for any DNA transaction. Because you can well imagine that if you have a duplex DNA and if you open it up, what will happen because of the helical structure, you will build supercoiling. You meet, you'll overwind the DNA on one side of the bubble. And if I have another side here, it will actually unwind on the other side. And for the helicases and transcription and polymerase replication to go on, you need to remove the supercoil, otherwise, after a while, you could not separate anymore. It would be all bundled. So topo 1 is essential for transcription and replication. And knocking out topo 1 uh, in, in mice or in flies um, is lethal. This is, there is no embryo. In yeast, it's permissible because there is probably compensation by the other topoisomerases. But 
yeast is, uh, is pretty sick as an aging phenotype. So another way to, to, to think of it, uh, what I just told you, is that as a replication machinery, transcription machinery, chromatin remodeling takes place, uh, you have to separate the two strands, which as a consequence will build positive superkerning uh, ahead of the unwinding of the DNA, especially because DNA is not free to swivel. It's very long or it's attached to nuclear matrix. And this needs to be resolved. And the resolution of this supercoil, the spectronym, is carried out by topo 1. And then topo DNA becomes relaxed, as a result of which then everything can go on. So this sneaking closing reaction is shown here. You have this covenant intermediate, which provides a swivel point for this strand to move around. And when it's fully relaxed, then it realigns and topo 1 is eliminated. So it's a reversible reaction. That's what's shown here. After the DNA is realigned, this attacks back and then it reverses. So it's all perfect, assuming topoisomerases don't get stuck in the middle of their activity. And in reality, they do get stuck. And they get stuck in different conditions. They can get stuck if you introduce a drug, such as a camptotecin, an anti-cancer drug. They can get stuck if the DNA itself is not perfect, so it misaligns and doesn't realign properly. So base damage introduces uh, what we call cleavage complexes, topo-1 cleavage complexes, which were abbreviated by top-1cc. And then in addition to that, uh, during apoptotic cell death, there are a lot of topo-1 cleavage complexes in the nucleus. So this is another process that's not been fully understood. It's probably a useful thing for the cells to, to mark all these uh, lesions on DNA and put topo-1 on it to... Uh, to go to full uh, apoptosis. So the two human topo-1s are the nuclear topo-1, the first discovered, the shampoo enzyme, the DNA untwisting enzyme. The DNA untwisting enzyme is made of three parts. It's got a, this is the head of the molecule, which contains the nuclear localization signal. And then all of this is the machinery that does the nicking closing. And the catalytic tyrosine is at the C terminus here. In uh, 2000, uh, when there were only five topoisomerases in, in, in humans, we decided to look uh, for another topo one, and we discovered the, uh, the, 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 the second topo one. And when we looked at it, we realized <clears throat> if you compare the nuclear versus the new topo one we had identified, that they were very, very conserved in all the catalytic motif. The, un the main difference was the end terminus. And the, the end terminus of that second gene we identified contains a very specific mitochondrial targeting sequence. So it's a duplication of the ancestral gene in vertebrates, where vertebrates have a nuclear topo 1, which we then re retain the name top 1, and then to uh, avoid having to change the whole nomenclature, we call that gene top one mt uh, And top one mt you could see in some ways, is uh, somewhat similar to the vaccinia topo one The vaccinia uh, virus encodes its own topo one because replication is in the cytoplasm, and it has to have a topo one to replicate. And you could see the gene is actually quite similar to the stripped-down version mitochondrial top one doesn't have a mitochondrial target sequence. So this is, again, the mechanism. So if you assume that you will have this uh, swivel, then you will relax DNA, and you'll get full relaxation. Many years before topo-1 was actually uh, became known, uh, the NCI had a very active drug discovery effort from natural products. And uh, the idea or the principle was that extracts from plants from all over the planet were put into murine leukemia uh, model in mice and looked for anti-leukemic activity. And one such activity uh, was found very potent from a, the bark of the Chinese tree, Camptotheca puminata technique. 
uh, as a result of which in the 60s, uh, this was purified and the active principle was named, was identified and was named Cantotesin from the name of the plant. Topo 1 was not known at the time. Cantotesin was pushed forward to clinical development and in 1970s went into clinical trial. It provided some responses to patients but was deemed difficult to use and toxic, and nobody knew how it worked, and the drug was shelved and put aside. The clinical trials were terminated in 1975. In 1990, cantotesin was discovered as a specific topo one b inhibitor, and drug companies went back. And knowing that cantotesin was very uh, non-water soluble, they made derivatives, which are now the one used and FDA approved, Topotican was developed in the United States, and Irinotican, uh, which is a pro-drug, water-soluble pro-drug, was developed in Japan. Now, these drugs are used uh, very, very routinely. Topotican is used, for instance, for small cell lung cancer, but for ovarian cancer in second-line therapy. Irinotican is used in second-line or first-line therapy for colon cancer and also for other diseases, lung cancer as well, and some pediatric cancers. And in Korea, there is a derivative, Belotican, which is also a water-soluble derivative. What was interesting is when the cantotesin came about, uh, and then we reconciled the fact that they were uh, inhibiting topo-1, the mechanism uh, was quite peculiar. The way the cantotesin works, this is the chemical structure of cantotesin, so it's a small molecule, it's quasi-planar, and initially people thought it could intercalate between base pairs of DNA, uh, yet it doesn't. And uh, the issue was that when you take purified topoisomerase 1, you take a little piece of DNA, topo 1 will, even if there is no supercoiling, will nick and close the DNA but usually you see very little nicking because it religates. So you have mostly this and very little of that. When you put cantotesin in a purified reaction system, what you see is the appearance of a lot of these cleavage complexes, which shifts the equilibrium, which led to the hypothesis that cantotesin was binding at the interface of the enzyme and the DNA in the cleavage site, which we then called interfacial inhibition. Because the way these drugs work is by blocking the complex. It's not by competing, competing with anything, they just distort. They take advantage of a little cavity, come in, and prevent religation. This was confirmed by crystal structure, and the crystal structure of topo can in topo-1 DNA complex is shown here. So this is the surface representation. Topo-1 is in gray, topo can is in reddish, and the DNA is in green. And if you take the surface away, you could see better the drug here in the cleavage complex, the break in the DNA backbone, and it's exactly what's drawn here. The drug is just bound at the interface of the enzyme and of the DNA. And this binding is very specific to, to, to topo-1. It doesn't bind into topo-2 cleavage complexes, no topo-3 cleavage complexes. It's absolutely specific. So nature has selected uh, over the, the evolution, uh, this particular chemical to be a toxin, which is produced in a number of trees, probably to, to kill the insects that are uh, feeding. So um, we also found that we've developed over the years uh, non cantotesin topo-1 inhibitors, I will rationalize why, and we have exactly the same type of crystal structure. This is this uh, non cantotesin topo-1 inhibitor. And these are in clinical trial here at the, uh, the building 10 now, in phase one. They act in the same way. They bind into the cleavage complex. You see the broken, broken strand here, the covenantly linked tyrosine, and the drug is stacked between the base pair. Makes a perfect sandwich, and also makes a number of interaction with the polypeptide protein, which renders it totally specific. Now we have a crystal structure for all the topo-1 inhibitors. They all work in the same way. They trap. That's what we call the trap because the cleavage complex is normally very reversible. When you put the drug in, it traps it. It cannot reverse. 
what's somewhat interesting is you may wonder how did the plant actually, re, uh, how do the plant uh, uh, manage to produce cantotecin uh, without killing themselves? Because the plant has the same topo 1 uh, as uh, it's highly conserved, and we know plant topo 1 is sensitive to cantotecin. And what was remarkable is when a group in Japan sequenced the plants that produce cantotecin, they found that these plants all have a mutation compared to the reference topo 1, next to the catalytic tyrosine, which is 723, but so it's a mutation N722S, and this was published some time ago. And what was most remarkable when they published this, then they wrote me an email saying that it was exactly the same mutation that we had observed in a human leukemia cell line that had been generated by selection by exposure to cancer. So it meant that a single amino acid uh, residue change confers total resistance to the drug, meaning that cantotecin are totally targeted by definition. And, and that's how the plants actually manage to grow. So in the, about uh, 10 years ago, now even more, I would say, um, we wondered whether we should develop new topo-1 inhibitors. And the rationals were pretty simple. Cantotecin, we knew already, were effective as anti-cancer drugs. Therefore, topo-1 was validated. Uh, we also know something else, is that even if you take a molecular target, uh, you could have two drugs that have exactly the same effect on the target in cells or in, in animals or in humans. The, the pharmacological effect would be very different. And one good example of this would be colchicine and vamblastin. Colchicine and vamblastin block tubulin polymerization by binding at the interface of the alpha and beta tubulin. When you look at the crystal structure, you could say colchicine equals vamblastin. But in therapeutics, it's not the case. You will not treat a, 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 you know, a leukemic patient with colchicine, and you will not treat a gout patient with vamblastin. So they are very different activities. Therefore, if we produce another drug, it's likely to have a different uh, clinical profile. And there was also a more rational idea, is that cantotecin, as we knew them, have limitation. Uh, when the reason they were abandoned initially, uh, in the first clinical trial, they're not well tolerated. In the 70s, medical doctors had difficulties with some of the toxicities. They were hard to overcome. Bone marrow toxicity, especially intestinal toxicity for enotecan, was a rate limiting, almost killed the drug. Uh, drug efflux substrate, the cantotecins are drug efflux substrate. And another problem is that these things are toxin produced by nature, but when you put them in patients, they immediately inactivate. See, cantotecin is a, what we call alpha hydroxylactone on this ring. This is the lactone form. This is the active form. As soon as you put cantotecin in, in, in buffer, within minutes, at physiological pH, it rings open carboxylate, and the carboxylate binds to ceramalbumin. So only a small fraction of cantotecin is active at any time, and it varies across people, but it's a few percent. So you're giving a lot of drugs to a very little true active. So that was a real problem. So we decided to, to look, and also because cantotecin bind reversibly. So they, they, they are very nice because they bind reversibly. If you treat cells with camptotecin, they immediately form cleavage, topo-1 cleavage complexes. You wash the cells away, the cleavage complexes reverse within minutes. So it's great because you could do very nice experiments, but in patients, it means you had to have long exposure to, to initiate enough damage. So we discovered the first non camptotecin topo-1 inhibitor taking advantage of the NCI screen. The NCI has 60 cell lines, that had since the 80s, 60 cell lines, that are used to screen drugs. When the murine model uh, was, was put aside, because it was good for leukemia, the NCI in the 80s decided to screen for drugs using cell-based model. So it was a really a pioneer enterprise. And the cells are derived from different tissue of origin. So for instance, this is the breast, these are CNS, these are colon, these are leukemia, melanoma, lung, ovarian, prostate, renal. And you could see now, if you take any given compound through the 67, there are 60 bars, uh, and you take camptopotecan, 
and you mean center the activity. So if a cell line is on the middle, it means that it's average sensitivity. If it's on the left, it means it's a cell line which is hyper resistant. And then if it's on the right, it means it's more sensitive than the average. What you see now is sort of a key. All you have generated is a key. And knowing, using that key, we use the software which was designed by our, our colleague Ken Paul, which we call, we call Compare. And we look for in the half a million compound in the database whether there was anything that looked like camptotestin but would not be a camptotestin. And came this thing, 314622, this is the code number. And this is the chemical structure. And then uh, <clears throat> when uh, we found this molecule, it had been deposited by a colleague of mine, Mark Cushman, whom I called. And Mark had put that molecule in the NCI screen because it was actually a byproduct of something else he was trying to synthesize. He was synthesizing, and that thing came up. It was not what he wanted, but he put in the database. And it's only 10 years later that we found it. And then I called Mark, and then we made a lot of derivatives to improve the activity. So this is the initiating compound. In 1998, we reported the first. So you see how long it takes, really, to get these things all the way. 1998 was the first the discovery of the adenoisopenine active. And it took 10 years uh, to go and, and screen about uh, uh, 500 of them to select three, which are now in clinical trials. So the three that are in clinical trial uh, are listed here. And they are in clinical trial here in building 10, finishing phase one for the last two. And this one is also in clinical trial with the two others in a, in a veterinarian clinical trial all over the United States where we're treating lymphoma and sarcoma dogs all across the U.S. with this compound. And we're seeing quite good activity with them uh, with reasonable toxicity. So they are tolerated. We killed no one, fortunately, in the phase one clinical trial, and we see some activity. So at this stage, what's going on is beyond the camptotestines, which are classical anti-cancer drugs, uh, the adenoisoquinoline could be viewed as a second generation topo-1 inhibitor. And then in parallel, there is another drug from Sanofi, Aventis, and Genzyme, which you could see look very much like our compound. So the adenoisoquinolines, as I said, have been selected. They are very potent. They are topo-1-CC targeted. They overcome the limitations of camptotestin. They are chemically stable. You can see that these molecules have no alpha hydroxylactone. They overcome resistance by drug reflux pump. They trap topo-1 at different genomic sites. And we believe, therefore, that their clinical spectrum of activity should be different. So before we started the phase one, uh, what we had to do and for phase one nowadays, it's very difficult to do a phase one uh, with just the sole intent of determining maximum tolerated dose. In the phase one, you have to have some kind of biomarker telling you that the drug has activity somewhere. So we decided to uh, took two biomarkers, uh, gamma H2X and top one, uh, top isomerase one itself. Uh, so. The reason we chose gamma H2AX, you're probably aware, because now it's fairly common all over the, the world, everybody has heard of it, but um, gamma H2AX was discovered uh, by a colleague of mine. We're in the same lab. We're in the same lab, Bill Bonner. So Bill Bonner, William Bonner, discovered H2AX, the gene, then discovered the modification, which is the phosphorylation of H2AX, which he called gamma H2AX, and nowadays, Gamma H2X is taken for granted. We assume it's always been there, but not been always there. But with Bill Bonner and Jim Dorosho, who is the NCI Director for Translation Research, and we, who is also in our branch, we decided first to validate Gamma H2X as a biomarker. And to do that, it's easy to say, much harder to do. We had to go back to murin model to make sure that Gamma H2X could be used as a biomarker in patients when we do the phase one. And we had to go back to topotecan because that's the reference drug. And then we had to establish whether we could, um, we could have a time and, and dose dependence. And these are examples of mice that have been treated with the adenoisoquinoline. And you could see the gamma H2AX positive cells here. So these are the untreated. Occasionally in the untreated, you have a few gamma H2AX. And when you treat with the topo-1 inhibitor, the adenoisoquinoline, you have very strong 
and very clear gamma H to X response, which you could quantify, which is quantified here. And under these conditions, what was nice too is that the mice actually had a fairly uh, obvious tumor response. This is the tumor growth in the untreated mice. This is the response with the adenoisoquinoline treated mice. So there's a very large uh, delay. And here are the responses with, with topotecan. And topotecan does this, but when you do this with topotecan, the mice are almost moribund. They lose 20% of their weight. So this is really maximum tolerated dose. Whereas here, it's, the mice are okay. So we felt we had a better drug. And the dose and the time is the issue. We had to make sure we could generate gamma H2X signal, which is abbreviated here, nuclear uh, fluorescent signal. And you could see we could generate this at uh, about a third of the maximum tolerated dose, about a fifth of the maximum tolerated dose. And the time was important because if you do biopsy after injection in the patient, when do you do it? You can't do it multiple times if you do it in the tumor. And we realized that you had to wait four or seven hours after the one-hour infusion to actually re-biopsy the patient to look at gamma h 2 x And then we also generate top one. And when the cell, when the uh, topo inhibitors are acting, then top one disappears. So it's a target engagement, which we call target engagement. Topo one gets degraded when it is targeted with the topo one inhibitor. You see as a function of concentration, and you could see this is visible also at four or seven hours. Topo one goes down. So we have two biomarker assays that are in the phase one clinical trial. So these drugs now are moving along. Hopefully, we'll keep moving. They are potent. They are specific inhibitors of top one, both in vitro, so they could be used as tool in biochemical assays and in cells. They are chemically stable, whereas this is being open. They are induced top one cleavage complexes in The cleavage complexes are persistent. Uh, they overcome uh, drug efflux resistance. They are anti-tumor. They are less toxic than topotecan. Histone gamma H2X is a sensitive biomarker, and the drugs are pushed for. So that's what I'm going to be telling you about uh, the topo-1 inhibitors. So if you want, you could ask a couple of questions. I'll put the book in. All right, so I'll move on to topo-2. So we've been on the left side. So what I've uh, shown you now is that the topo-1 is one-strand uh, one break. Topo-1 is linked to the 3 prime end, which is shown here. In the case of the topo-2, it's a little more complicated because it's a homodimer. It's a homodimer, and each monomer is going to cleave one strand, and the cleavage is at the 5 prime end. And the two subunits are cleaving with a canonical four base pair stack. So this is the five prime linkage and the four base pair stack. So now what you generated is a two, uh, a two, two breaks uh, open. Now the differences between topo one and topo two are many. Uh, they are structurally unrelated. Uh, the only thing in common is they use a tyrosyl. Uh, so they are tyrosyl for their tyrosyl to break DNA, but that's it. But whereas topo one doesn't use ATP, topo two has to burn ATP uh, to, to carry out this cleavage religation mechanism. Topo two also requires magnesium, whereas topo one doesn't. Topo one can work at zero degrees. Topo two does not. The drugs that act on topo two are totally different from topo-1, a toposide for topo-2, camptotacine for topo-1, they don't cross over, and antracycline quinolones are for topo-2. So there are two forms of topo-2 in humans and all the old vertebrates. Uh, and one is called alpha, and the other one is called beta. Alpha was the first discovered, beta was discovered later. Uh, two, two different genes, and you could see they are very, very conserved. Uh, the degrees of similarities are very high, uh, especially in the core domain, which contains the catalytic tyrosine. 
catalytic tyrosine for TOPO2 is in the middle, but they differ in the C terminus and the little n terminus. You could see also they are somewhat related to the bacterial TOPO2 way, which is E. coli DNA gyrase, except that in, in E. coli, uh, it's, the genes are made in two, two bits. So you have uh, the jar A and jar B, and then the two. So it, it's made of different bits. And the, uh, the, these enzymes also have a high degree of conservation, and they use metals to coordinate with the DNA. So you see this is the DNA backbone, and then these are the residues and the enzymes that are highly conserved, and that's how they are formed using the magnesium, is to coordinate the DNA with the enzyme. Now, these two enzymes in humans uh, have different expression, different function. Top 2 alpha is associated with replication. It's ex essentially uh, highly expressed in, in highly replicating cells and cancer cells. So breast cancers, for example, overexpress topo 2 alpha with HER2. Topo 2 beta is expressed in all cells, including proliferating cells but also in cells that do not proliferate. So if you take the heart, for example, the heart has topo 2 beta, but does not express topo 2 alpha. It has the gene, but it's not expressed. The brain has topo 2 beta, but does not express topo 2, topo 2 alpha. So um, these, these are division of function. That's why probably there are two different genes. And the topo 2 catalyzes a broad range of reactions. The best way for me to describe what TOPO2 does, it works like an NIH gate. So a TOPO2 will only let you enter, or let you, if you are a strand of DNA, if you first go through one gate, it closes back and then goes to the second. So let's look at this. So you have two strands of DNA, and I'm trying to get that strand to go across that one, okay? So what TOPO2 will do, it will open a first gate. So TOPO2 is a dimer. It will bind one strand of DNA, so that would be the, uh, the, the strand which will be cleaved, and then it has one strand at the top. Gets the strand in the top, so you have gotten in the first part, you're inside the enzyme now with the other strand. The, sec the strand, the passing strand then goes through and uses ATP and magnesium, and then it goes to the other end, and this is religated before actually it opens up. So it's a totally safe reaction. It's a two-gate mechanism. You open up, get one strand in, close, the strand is in, reopen, the strand is out. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a strand passage. It's what we call as a strand passage. As a result of which, <clears throat> it's not a very fast reaction, but it's a very, uh, uh, very effective reaction for a lot of reactions. One of them is decatenation. So when you replicate two circles, a supercurled circle like a Möbius strip, you will end up with catenase. And topo 2 is absolutely required to do this. Topo 1 cannot do that. You have to open two strands. Past. So this is what we call uh, decatenation. It can be reversed catenation. It can remove knots because you will cleave and then let one strand go. It will not. It could also re relax supercurling. Uh, that's okay. And one enzyme, which is gyrase in bacteria, can even generate negative supercoil. It will go generating negative supercoil. In, in vertebrates, there is no such thing as a gyrase. So the drugs that act on TOPO2 are many. Uh, there are two classes for, the, uh, for your TOPO, the ones you have in your cells. Uh, it's the uh, anti-cancer drugs. The anti-cancer drugs are listed here. The most specific TOPO2 inhibitor, if you want to use it as a, as a tool or rea reagent in your experiment, is etoposide. Etoposide or teniposide. Doxorubicin is a, or donorubicin, a very effective TOPO2 inhibitor. And there is no doubt that a great part of their anti-cancer activity is related to TOPO2. However, uh, these drugs are also DNA intercalating agents, you could see by the chemical structure, and therefore they have many, many other effects. They also generate oxygen radicals, 
So therefore, the intracyclines, which is doxorubicin, doxorubicin, uh, doxorubicin, are two, two poisons, but they are also interpolators for ROS generation. And then you have other topo 2 inhibitors here, uh, such as uh, nitoxantrone and other inhibitors. The antibiotics are listed here, and some are well known of all of us, such as nalidixic acid, uh, or such as ciprofloxacin, and so on, and the newer uh, quinolones. And those are only targeted to the bacterial topo 2 gyrase and topo 4, and not to the host. And that's why you could take the antibiotics they're not toxic to you, they're just toxic to the bacteria because those drugs are so selective for their enzymes that they don't do it. The way the topo-2 inhibitors uh, block the topo-2 or trap the topo-2 cleavage complexes uh, is very similar, in fact, to what happens with topo-1. So the paradigm that was first developed for topo-1 inhibitor now has been extended to topo-2 inhibitor. And you could see here this is the structure uh, uh, of a cleavage complex with etoposide. So this would be the etoposide molecule. And this is drawn with sort of uh, 3D, if you wish, 2D, 3D. And this is the crystal structure of a topo-2 homodyne. And you can see here the monomer and the other monomer. And the drug is nested right in here. As you can see by transparency, the broken, the DNA that's broken by the topo-2 is in here. And if you flip, flip this 90 degrees, now you can see better the DNA. You can see the drug molecules are nested inside the cleavage site, just inside, and they bind at the interface. And you can see the interface. They have a total interfacial inhibition. So like the topo-1 inhibitor, these type of agents are interfacial inhibitors, uh, such so as are many natural products. But what's been extended to is it's not only true for the topo-2 inhibitor, which are natural products, but also for, <coughs> uh, for the antibacterial. So this is the structure of the uh, bacterial uh, topo-4. And this is made of four parts. But the four parts came out very similar to the two parts of the human topo-2. And you can see each uh, symmetric. Uh, so it's a tetramer, but uh, the dimer here, dimer there. And the quinolone are bound and block the bacterial uh, topo-2 very much the same way as etoposide would block the eukaryotic topo-2 or acanthotesin the topo-1 binding at the interface. So the principle of interfacial inhibition extends all the way to all the topo inhibitors. So that led to the idea, and if you want to read more about this, because this is not limited to topo inhibition. This is actually a paradigm that extends to many, many natural products and even HIV, uh, anti-HIV drugs, uh, metalloprotein inhibitors and work on that. So then the question, we'll finish on this, is why in the end these drugs uh, would be of any interest for cancer, uh, knowing that topoisomerases are present in normal cells. So cancer cells have tend to have more topoisomerase than cancer cells. So yes, they could be more sensitive because they have more topoisomerases, so the drugs will make more DNA damage. But that's not that satisfactory. Uh, so in fact, what you would say that uh, the clinical use of, of topo-targeted drugs would be for patients who have high topo level because they will generate more damage, but especially if they have defective DNA repair. Because what's really happening is as the cancer arises, uh, benefiting from DNA repair deficiencies that enable some, uh, some mutation and adaptation, uh, these DNA repair deficiencies are an Achilles heel. And then if you have that, then the, the cells will become more sensitive to DNA damaging agents, such as topo-1 and topo-2. And you could see here, the pathways that confer particularly sensitivity to topo-1 inhibitor and to topo-2 inhibitor. And this is a panel of a DNA repair deficient cell line. So this was published, I think, this year uh, by uh, our co together with our colleagues. But you could see that the BRCA, all these cells are single knockout for a BRCA gene, BRCA uh, for a HR gene, uh, are extreme, are much more sensitive than wild type. Wild type would be underlying. And 
Uh, other cells will come the Fanconi cell, also are very sensitive to the topo uh, one inhibitor. And on the topo two side, you could also see the sensitivity of the BRCA cell or the sensitivity of transfusion polymerase cells. So there are probably a number of predisposing diseases that are cancer related, or, uh, defect, cancer related, that, that play a role. So the way these topo cleavage complexes are repaired is, is actually not so, is better known nowadays. So if you have a topo 1 cleavage complex, the problem is you generate a topo cleavage complex at the 3' end of DNA. So you have a tyrosine linked to the 3' end, and this is a massive lesion on the DNA. If you have a topo 2 cleavage complex, you have a topo 2 linked to the 5' end. And what has emerged over the last 10 years is that cells uh, going down to yeast, um, all eukaryotes have actually a tyrosyl DNA phosphodiesterase 1. And that enzyme, which was uh, discovered here at NIH by Howard Nash, uh, removes the tyrosyl DNA phosphodiesterase 1. So it's a surgical enzyme which will remove the topo 1 cleavage complex and enable cells to repair. And the fact it's conserved in all, ver in all eukaryotes telling us that topo 1 cleavage complex is actually formed spontaneously and need to be dealt with. And more recently, a second gene has been identified, at least in humans and most vertebrates, which is TDP2. And it is specific for the repair of topo 2 cleavage complex. And in addition to this, cells use endonuclease to remove uh, the whole chunk of DNA. And now what you start seeing is a number of genes that are known in cancer uh, for being deficient, such as ERCP1, or such as MR11, which is known to be deficient in a number of cancers, or XPGs. Uh, and, and it would tell you right away that if a cancer cell is deficient in this pathway, it's absolutely dependent on that pathway because of the redundancy is not infinite. Uh, so it means that the Achilles heel of cancer cell may be that they are defective somewhere in these pathways, and that's what renders them more susceptible uh, to topoisomerase inhibitors. And that's what we would like to know in patients, is which of these genes are altered in which patient. And actually, they are more often altered than we ever thought before. So maybe uh, this is sort of another way to draw it, is that you have the two pathways, the cleavage pathway, and then the I think, uh, yeah, I think this is the same. I'll just leave it there. And uh, I'll take any question if you have any at this time. I'll be happy to answer email if you have any, any questions. Well, I think at this stage, uh, mostly it's by genetics. So what we have to uh, to look at is uh, do well, sequence the tumor and find uh, which tumors have uh, mutations. In. So we have we have a limited list of genes. It's not like we have huge. It's 50. Uh, so mutation, deleterious mutation, but not only deleterious mutation, uh, expression. For example, TDP1. Unexpectedly, I never thought this would be, but is, is, in the 60 cell line of the NCI, we found two lung cancers that have no protein. And now I've looked back at other uh, samples, other cell lines, and other lung cancer cells seem to have no TD. So in which case, maybe, so we would need to look at message or methylation of the genes and know when, when they are turned off. And if they are, then presumably, then you would assume that these would be more sensitive. For the clinical trial, the samples have been archived. So what, you know, so if we'll, we'll deconvolute these. The issue on phase one, and that's a huge issue, is for a drug to really exhibit activity on phase one is extremely challenging. So you could have a very rare responder, and in which case you could go back and resequence and find out why uh, among the candidate genes, is there anything that really speaks to you? But what you have to have first is a few 
responder. So usually that you'll have to get in phase two. So if you go to phase two, especially at the NIH, uh, in any research institution, you have to have tumor sample. Otherwise, if you have a responder, you can't track it. Even if you have all the genomics, you may not be able to track it, but at least you have the tools to go. It has to be inside the control trial to, to understand. Yeah, thank you.